Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. So hi, I'm Tracy Stuckrath, the host of the Eating at a Meeting podcast and Thrive Meetings and Events. And we are here this week after I spent a weekend with Lauren right here at the Fair Food Allergy Summit. Lauren Saltwich. She has been deathly allergic to milk and tree nuts her entire life, like from birth. Her day job is a social media marketing and financial services, but in her spare time, she advocates for food allergy awareness through her book, Crying Over Spilled Milk, and through her work on FAIR's Rising Leaders Committee. So hey, Lauren. Hi, Tracy. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'm so excited. So last week, weekend, not this past weekend, but the weekend before you were on a panel with four other young professionals, and you were talking about how to manage your food allergies in the workplace. And it was such an interesting conversation, you know, and I talk about it a little bit, but in in the work that I do, but getting it from listening to the four of you talk about it. And as you are actually entering the workforce as well and managing that, that was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really great topic and a good panel that we are offering now at the fair summit. You know, we've seeing all these kids that were in grade school and now we had to navigate college. Now we have to prepare for them entering the workforce. So it's a really good topic to start talking about. So what prompted you? I mean, I know I said you were, you had, peanut or nut and milk allergies since birth, basically. So tell people how you've managed that through your whole life and how many years have you been in the workforce? Yeah, definitely. So my whole life, I, you know, I was a nineties baby. So back then the rule was avoid, avoid, avoid at all costs. So that's what I did up until about college where I got a little brave, if you will. But I try to eat out at some restaurants. Sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't. So that's when I kind of really learned my first taste of independence with my food allergies. I grew up in Cincinnati and I went to college in, in Chicago. So I was in a different time zone from my parents who had raised me and made sure that I was safe all those years. So I entered the workforce in January of 2014. And my first job, I was actually a travel writer. So I was navigating a lot of those challenges that come with that and packing food and figuring out how to do everything on my own. And then about in 2015, I started working in the corporate world. And I think I am one of the only people that I've ever contacted with of all my colleagues over the years who has a food allergy. And, you know, there's a couple things that have always kind of stuck with me in navigating those challenges that the one of the biggest ones is just vending machines. So I would always pack my own lunch and sometimes I would pack a dinner if I knew we were going out for a happy hour afterwards or doing a dinner so I would just eat at my desk. But if I wanted a snack during the day, if I had eaten all my food already, going to a vending machine, I've lost so much money putting money in these vending machines because they don't show you the reverse side to look at the ingredients. Wow. So true. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's nothing really to do about that. Another thing that's strange to navigate that I've noticed is coming down to benefits. And we talked about this on a panel a little bit, but a lot Mm -hmm. of companies will offer, Hey, like part of our benefits package is free meals and you know, all the things that come with that. But for those of us with very severe food allergies, we may not take advantage of that benefit. So that's another thing just that, you know, we're starting to get awareness of in the workplace. Well, and that brings me back to an interview I had a couple of years ago with a food service manager. She was a general manager of a company cafeteria and she actually worked with the company to find out all the allergens of the employees so that they could actually make sure they were labeling for those along with the top nine, top eight at the time, but top nine. And, and then because the food was free for breakfast and lunch. And so learning to do that, but then one person ended up, he was, he was kosher, practice kosher. And so she worked with him, but they couldn't accommodate him based on what he needed. And so they ended up subsidizing his paycheck 
to giving him money equal to what the breakfast and lunches amounted to. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's outstanding. And that's really encouraging and inspiring mm-hmm. for people like me. And what I learned on the panel is there's a lot of people that think like us mm-hmm. is I am not in a place at my career where I feel confident enough to go to my boss or go to HR and say, I would like some more money because I cannot partake in any free <laughs> meals or lunches or anything. You know, It's just such a new thing for these corporations right. to figure out. So I think advocates, advocacy and awareness is really the primary first step in all this, but it also comes down to where do we start? You know, who do we reach right. out to? Right. Um, it's it's on my to-do list to reach out to one of our business resource groups or BRGs. Most corporations have them. And just to kind of, you know, bring this up to their attention and say, hey, you know, for those of us with food allergies or, you know, dietary needs of all sorts and kinds these days, you know, what can you start to think about or what can you start to offer uh, this mm-hmm. portion of your workforce? Right. Exactly. Because it does come down to figuring out how you can manage. And I know I heard of a company that sent pizza home to everybody during COVID. And, and my first thought is like coming, bring, sending pizza home to your house, right? Which they probably didn't ask, you know, and and maybe it was your kid that was food allergic. And no, so milk is never allowed in the house, right? So how do you, it opens up a whole nother level of risk, and, and considerations to think about. It absolutely does. And you just made me remember an amazing point that you made during the panel was that employers cannot legally ask us, right? Uh, mm-hmm. What our disabilities are or what our mm-hmm. restrictions are. So it's on us to step right. up and raise our mm-hmm. hand and speak for ourselves. It really is. And, and any HR manager will tell you that. I mean, they're not well, you, they're not legally allowed to ask you about your disability. So if you want to, but that's a fine line too of, do you share your disabilities in advance? And I know JJ said that he, and, and he'll never know. He said, I think he said, he'll never know if he didn't get the job because of that or because he wasn't qualified, but you know, that, that is a fine line to, to, to navigate when you're looking for a job. Absolutely. I know I said that I never know if I should check the box on a job application if if I have a disability or not, because mm-hmm. I think, you know, what they're really looking out for is, you know, will you need a desk that can accommodate a wheelchair or mm-hmm. something along those traditional, better known types of disabilities? Mm-hmm. Right. But, you know, what are they called? Food allergies, like the hidden disability. <laughs> hidden, yep, yeah, it is a hidden disability. Yep. And so, and, and actually this month is Disability Employment Awareness Month. So that's why I really wanted to talk about this because it is, food allergies are considered a disability. And actually I'll find some links that I found from Jan, which is the job network and under the employment, you know, Department of Labor, you know, show, talking about what this is and what kind of accommodations that you can do. So in your experience, what kind of, things have you have you shared your food allergies with your employers and how has that worked yeah i've had three main employers so far on my career path and the first one it was a very small company so it really wasn't that big of an issue it was just easier to have that kind of conversation there wasn't even an hr department at that company so it was really just hey we're there's 15 of us we're just going to work together and i'm just going to bring my food and we'll figure it out the second one is when i went to a a bigger company and you know i was i didn't i never like really disclosed it in the interview process or anything like that but i did mm-hmm. tell my boss when i first started just to give him a heads up and just for my whole team to know and be aware. And you know, it just goes back to awareness and understanding. You know, I remember for one of my birthdays, my boss's intention was so kind. He went out and he sought out a gluten-free cupcake, but he, I think just got confused that I am like a milk and tree nut allergy and not a gluten um, Mm -hmm. allergy or or, uh, celiacs or what, or any of those types of things. But, um, and I just, chose to smile and accept it and say, thank you so much. And then I didn't eat it. I'm like, oh, you know, I just had lunch. I'm too full. So I'm just, you know, sneaking in all these little white lies because I don't want to offend, you know, the person who it's a, it's a weird dynamic when you enter the workforce, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't want to offend someone who has a say in your salary, who has a say on your career path, on your career trajectory, you know, reputation is very important in these types of corporations and companies anywhere you work. And then, so then when my next employer, I just didn't say anything until I got invited to lunch with the CMO. And I had told her that, you know, I wasn't super hungry. I had a big breakfast. I just ordered a plain salad, just 
lettuce, tomato, like onion. And then I started eating the salad and immediately my tongue started to tingle, you know, that tightness feeling. And I'm like, oh, here we go. So I actually opened up a Benadryl capsule under the table, got it out of my wallet. And then I'm trying to like sneak this Benadryl while she's talking. And she's like, are you okay? Are you, are you, do you have a headache or like, what's going on? Why, what are you taking? And then I just had to come clean because I just got caught in the act. And she was so sweet and kind about it. And she was so understanding. And I think it kind of, in that case, helped for someone in a leadership position to see how severe my food allergies are. Mm Because then it's someone else advocating for you. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people with food allergies are met with a lot of skepticism or how severe is Mm -hmm. it or, you know, do you really have to do this? So it's good to have someone, especially in a leadership position in your corner. That's a really good point because it is and it depends on who that person is. You know, if they have if they're willing to be empathetic, you know, to to that. And I know there's a woman who I wrote about in one of the, one of the books I co-authored you at work and humans at work. I'll send you those. And, you know, she told, she actually took her, her complaint about her company all the way to the department of Massachusetts department of disabilities, because they wouldn't do anything about it. And she, she like you, you know, well, hers is airborne and I know yours is touch, right? Right. Mine is touch. The milk allergy can be airborne if we're in a tightly enclosed coffee shop and they're boiling milk. That's Mm -hmm. when I start to wheeze. But yes, touch. There was another time where I had my hands at my keyboard. It was my first day on the job and I guess it wasn't cleaned very well or something happened. But I had a a reaction on my wrists from the from the key from the pad, uh, the wrist pad. So, (laughs) wow. Yeah. That. And so did you just go get a new call technology and ask them to bring you a new wrist pad? Oh, no, it was it was day one. I was not about to make any <laughs> waves. I was just like, I'll just go wash my hands and I'll get a Clorox wipe and I'll just clean this down. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's really tough to navigate because I think for your, you know, put yourself in the shoes of someone with food allergies and your whole life, you know, you're in school, you have to be in school, like you, there's no other mm-hmm. choice. So you, so you have to be able to learn in an environment that is safe for you. You, if you go to college, you're paying for a higher education, you're paying mm-hmm. a lot of money for that. So you kind of have every right and the grounds to kind of make certain demands, but then you enter the workforce and it's like, I'm working for this company. And it's, it's a lot more of a sensitive situation, I think. I think so too. And I don't know if you were in the session on the, the laws about that at the fair conference. And I know she didn't get to the workplace one, which I really wanted to listen to, but it is. And and Laurel said a really good thing is like in school in one K through 12, you're in school and it's government provided in college. It's your choice to go to college and at work. It's your choice to choose to work someplace, but it's also, they've also hired you. Right. So it's, I think it's a conundrum of both a mixture of both of those. It is. It is. And I think it's also that you bring a good point of, you know, we're working for them, but they also hired us. And I think ever mm-hmm. since the pandemic happened and we've a lot of people have proven if if you're able to work from home and do so, you can do that. And I think people and em, employees are feeling more empowered to you know make the interview process a two way street. I think employees are on their way to kind of just demanding a little more respect. So maybe this is a mm-hmm. good time for those with food allergies to take advantage of this movement and speak up for themselves as well. That's a really good point. Cause I, you know, and you're, you're coming back into the workplace. Hey, I have these needs, you know, what can we do? And one of the questions that I asked you all at the panel was what questions do you ask of your future employers to figure out if it's a place that you are going to feel safe? Yeah. And in my case, I think JJ had some really good questions, but in my case, I didn't even ask questions because I didn't want people to really know. I didn't want that to be defined Mm -hmm. how I worked. If I were to ask, I would just kind of say, you know, what types of team outings do you do so that I can kind of mentally prepare for, Mm -hmm. okay, if this is a team that's going out to dinner and lunch every day, and, you know, that might affect my decision if I want to work in a place like that. And, you know, I think with the whole work from home theme, that's been emerging, you know, do you offer that flexibility? Because Mm -hmm. I have been able to eat so much healthier working from home. I can prepare meals from home Mm -hmm. and I'm not going out to the local pharmacy to get a microwave meal. If we have a last minute happy hour, get together, (laughs) a little less preservatives in that meal. Right. Well, and that that just breaks my heart that you're going to the, to the convenience store to get a microwave meal to eat because you're going out 
you know, to, to network. And to me, that limits, it potentially limits your opportunities for growth in your company. Right, right. I think JJ brought up a good point too, where he was saying, you know, if you get invited out and you're meeting clients and if they're all sitting at a table and they have like a cocktail and there's apps and maybe they're smoking a cigar. And if you're not partaking in any of that, someone might get offended, especially if they're the mm-hmm. ones footing the bill. And right. you don't, it's, it, there's a fine line between drawing a lot of attention to yourself and making it about you, but then also you don't want to offend anyone or make anyone uncomfortable. Right. I mean, I've made so many people uncomfortable because I've just chosen not to eat out at restaurants and people don't like eating around people who aren't eating. <laughs> it's just <laughs> human nature, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of an article that came out in the Washington Post years ago when somebody from a foreign country was coming and he was in the middle of his fast and it was all written up in the paper like, well, he can't put his religious beliefs on us. Well, he's not. He's just choosing not to eat. Yes. Right. Yes. And and we have to learn to be comfortable with that. But yes. at the same time, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, what are your practices and how can we fully how can you fully bring yourself to the workplace? right? Safely. Absolutely. And I think safely is another part of it. And here's another piece of the puzzle that you just made me think of in terms of safety. It's, it's not just the workplace. It's also the commute. So I take the train to work and one day I was wearing a pencil skirt and I sat down on the train cushion and then my legs just started to itch. And I stood up and there was pistachio shells. I mean, that that's a whole nother thing. I'm like, you're allergic to tree nuts and and probably in a busy train, you're sitting down, you're not, you don't have the chance to look at the chair and wipe it down. Like you may be on a plane, get on early and do that. Wow. Absolutely. So then I, I get to work and I'm like in the bathroom, like trying to clean my skirt, trying to wash it, trying to wash my legs. Cause when you're on the train, you know, sometimes there's a bathroom in your car, but you can't exactly get up and do anything. You're just stuck. Right. Right. If you can't drive to work because it's one, too expensive or two, the the commute is much longer than taking the train. That's another big issue. Where are you based out of? I didn't even ask that. Yeah, I I work in the city of Chicago and I I live in the Chicago suburbs. So I could drive, but it's just easier to take the train and you get some more time back. You can work from the train. It's really nice Mm -hmm. until you sit on pistachios. (laughs) Pistachios. Yes. Wow. That you would never thought, but thinking about also the baseball teams that do peanut, you know, nut free games or nut free areas, you know, to allow that and they make sure they're cleaning it off and things like that. But it's still that's that's a public place and there's not anybody sweeping it up and making sure that, you know, in between, you know, it's especially in the daily commute. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it just comes down to if you don't have food allergies, just clean up after yourself. I mean, if not for someone with food allergies, you just, you know, something we learn as children, just clean up after yourself. Right. Exactly. So understanding one of the other things that came up in that, that conversation at fair conference was coming at it with a place of dignity, right? Because one of the challenges is, you know, in, in coming to the workforce, you actually have to educate some other people like your boss that, you know, bought you that cupcake. Right. But it's like, understanding what anaphylaxis is and understanding, you know, what cross contact is and what that might mean, but we can get angry or frustrated with people because they don't know it, but it's not like it's something you went to the store and bought and you can return and there's knowledge about it. So how do you, how do you go about educating other people about your allergens? Yeah, I think it helps too. I think it helps too that Growing up, I was the only kid in my whole school with food allergies. So I kind of always just had to navigate around other people's feelings. Like I didn't really have anyone on my team per se. Mm -hmm. So I've looked over the years, maybe it's a coping mechanism or what, but I use a lot of humor in my day to day. Or I, you know, I'll say like, oh, we're going to have team lunch. Oh, that's great. Like, you know, I'll, I'll join, I'll get a, I'll get like a soda or a water, but you know, I'm not going to eat lunch because like, I know we have that big meeting this afternoon and, you know, I don't want to have to go home and miss it or, you know, like you don't want to see what's going to happen to me or like you don't want to have to like deal with HR and like, you know, have an ambulance mm-hmm. come and ruin the dinner. So I, don't know, I try to approach it from a stance of making them more comfortable above okay. myself, which I think has worked. You know, it's a very, uh, how, what's the word for it? It's like, it, I disarm myself to make other people more comfortable. And I think it really has helped on my career path. I think 
people feel more that they can approach me more or Mm -hmm. that, you know, I can, it kind of maybe has shown that I'm a little more adaptable because Mm -hmm. of my food allergies. Right. Uh, So, yeah. And and that, again, that's another fine line to to cross because you do want to, you want to disarm them because you do need to disarm them because it's like, I'm not necessarily going to go into anaphylactic shock, but I might. Right. So it's like letting them know that there is this concern, but Mm -hmm. also that you and you can control it, but you need their help to control it. Exactly. Exactly. And I will say, too, that people are, you know, I I really believe that for them, you know, generally people are kind. Nobody wants to Mm -hmm. see you have have a reaction. And Mm -hmm. I think people are naturally skeptical, but I don't think anyone comes from a malicious place necessarily. Right. And, but that's where I think it could turn bad. You know, if you start to kind of make these demands and if you become like the problem employee, that's where like, that's what, like my worst fear is what employers ever see me as. Well, and, and you made a really good point and you don't want to be seen as your allergen. You want to be seen as the person who does the good work, right? Not as, and even on a television show that I was watching last night, I think FBI one of the FBI shows and the kids got cancer. And he's like, I'm, it, I'm just, I'm like the sick kid or the kid does this, this. And, and that can really burden you. Absolutely. It becomes almost a defining trait, but you know, you can also make that work to your advantage sometimes too. Like for example, I help a lot with like copy review and like, mm-hmm. t- like, you know, looking out for spelling and grammar mistakes and there have been things that I've caught that people are like, oh, wow, this was reviewed by 12 other people. Thank you so much for catching that. And then I'll say, oh, you know, like I have to read ingredients, you know, for a living, basically. So I have a lot of attention to detail and, you know, it kind of, you know, you can use it as like your strengths. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, like I, I, because of my, the way I live, I have to have this very strong attention to detail and I can bring that into the workplace too. That's an awesome trait, you know, to, to showcase that. Oh, I love that. Now in your book, which is don't cry over spilled milk or crying over spilled milk. Sorry. (laughs) You have a chapter in there where you bullied as a kid, but I want to talk about it as a kid, but I also want to talk it as an adult because in my episode, I think it was episode 158 that published yesterday, 159. It actually on podcast episodes, go download it today. My friend Heather and I witnessed a gentleman who was in his fifties being bullied at an awards banquet for his company. And he got up from his table and came and sat at the staff table because he was being bullied by his coworkers. People, you're 40, 50 years old. Get over. Stop. (laughs) That's just really disheartening to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you wonder what they were even saying. Like, what does bullying look like when you're 40 or 50? The the name calling doesn't really stick (laughs) as well. No, they were like trying to make him eat different foods. Oh, just try it. You'll, You'll be fine. And yeah. Oh no, not okay. No. Yeah, I am so grateful that no one has ever really, you know, thrown food into my face. That is that's very much appreciated. Um, I think I, I think that bullying sometimes has become to be a really harsh word. So I think I'm going to say that I've never really felt like I've been bullied. I think I've just been at the receiving end of misunderstanding. I won't even go far and say it's ignorance or anything, because unless this is a part of your life, you're not going to understand it. And, you know, I'm guilty of that exact same thing. You know, we all are products of our perceptions. So I guess what I will say to anyone, whether you have food food allergies or you don't have food allergies, it just comes down to, you know, putting a smile on your face and taking it with grace and with pride. I have had coworkers, you know, if we're having lunch delivered to the room, they'll just kind of take it upon themselves to announce like, do not give Lauren any of the cheese sandwiches because she will die. And I think like, I think it's coming from a good place. But sometimes it's like, I don't want that kind of attention or, you know, like if we're at a happy hour ordering drinks, I'll say, oh, I'll just do like a beer. And they're like, oh, but we have this cocktail as a special right now. And they'll say, are you trying to kill my friend? And like, I, you know, oh I think goodness. it's, it's coming from a good place, but sometimes it's a little too extreme with like the death and the killing because it's real and it's true. And I don't fault anyone for ever saying that because I think it's their way of kind of also, and maybe like disarming themselves or me, but yeah, I don't think that like, <clears throat> that's any form of bullying. I think it's just kind of people trying to make themselves and others comfortable in a dis- in an uncomfortable situation. That's a really good point because they, they're trying to care for you and they're caring for you in their own way, but it, it can be a little disarming for sure. Yes. 
And I will say, you know, to, to piggyback on that, back when I was a travel writer, I was doing a, sp- a spread article on a trip to Wisconsin. And the editor wanted me cheese, to go to the cheese state. Yeah, the cheese state, which is fine. I got in laws and family in Wisconsin. But they wanted me to cover a dairy farm. And I was like, you know, like I'll go to the dairy farm, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do the tours because I've seen pictures of these tours and you're walking through these aisles that are just covered in milk all over the ground. And sometimes they will like, have you try to like milk the cow? And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to do that kind of stuff. And he just, you know, he kind of was just like really dismissive. And he's like, well, you'll figure it out. Like, just just go and, and make it work. And it wasn't this is like I said, it's not necessarily bullying, but it also wasn't extremely empowering or comforting at the same time. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> because I mean, you're, ha- you're on that job specifically, you're traveling for work and, and how does that, you know, where does that employment and, and I don't know if you were a contractor or an employee, you know, where does that draw the line of employee safety? Right. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, I was an employee and we did, you know, we were able to strike a deal when it came to because <clears throat> there was a lot of road trips. So when it came to eating on the road, he, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't expense a dinner or expense something. So I was able to buy like groceries so that I could, you know, like make, have a microwave meal at the hotel or just like make a quick little sandwich or something. Mm-hmm. But then that was a really hard thing to navigate too, because he made it very clear that I, that I was not to buy groceries for my house, that it was only to be used on trips. <laughs> so like, he was just really a stickler for, uh, which, which, you know, as an employer on a budget, mm-hmm. I can't, argue with that. Uh, I think it's just, it's a new thing. Like I said, it's just people trying to make the best out of a hard and fairly new situation that no one's ever really had to deal with before. Right. Well, and I, so I'm going to a convention next week and, you know, going to a convention and I don't know if you have to go to social media conventions for your job or whatever. It's like, that's a whole nother level of management. Cause there, you know, there's this event I'm going to has concession stands. So it's not banquet dinners or anything like that. There are a few that are separate, but you know, do you, you get an Airbnb versus a hotel, right? Cause you have a little bit more control over your environment that you stay. Yes. I love <clears throat> this concept of Airbnbs and VRBOs. That wasn't when, gosh, when did those start? I feel like that wasn't really an option back when I was a travel writer. It was just like <laughs> hotel or, or you live out of your car. Right. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, absolutely. Well, and I actually, I went to a uh, hotel recently and I said, Hey, I need a refrigerator for some food allergy food. And they gave me the little tiny one that was for medicine. I'm like, Mm -hmm. you can't, for you, you can't put anything in there. It's not a medical. So you do need the larger refrigerator Mm -hmm. that you can put food in because of that reason. And so I hope they all don't go to just that little tiny one, right? Without charging you. $35 a day. Well, that's another thing. Yeah. Usually if I ask for a fridge, it's like the, you know, standard mini fridge, but then Mm -hmm. surprisingly a a lot of other times hotels have said, well, we won't be able to know until the day of if if we can get you a refrigerator or not, because it's kind of on a first come first serve basis. Again, not their fault. They're just trying to do their job Mm -hmm. and, you know, they have limited supplies. So then my workaround is, you know, I would just take a cooler, like my my best quality cooler and, you know, just a little Mm -hmm. one and put my food in there. And then there's always ice machines in hotels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I would just find the, local, the closest ice vending machine and fill up a little bag of that and refill up my cooler. Okay. So there's a lot of workarounds, but it also is a lot more, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of steps to take. It is. And I think that comes back to using it to your advantage in the workforce. I mean, we, people with food allergies have so much to think about, so much to navigate. We're always coming up with workarounds. And I really do mm-hmm. think that it helps us in the work, in the workplace. You know, mm-hmm. when, when, when someone says there's no solution to this problem, we're the ones that figure out a way because that's what we've had to do our whole lives or, mm-hmm. or you know, whenever you were diagnosed. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a, it's a really good point, but it, it does take a lot of extra steps and especially when it's food, right? Because it's, it's, well, and I say especially because it's food, but I mean, food is a whole different navig challenge, right? And you said it with the labels and the vending machines, right? Or if you're going into the company cafeteria, I actually went to an opening of a new restaurant the other day and I was like, okay, nothing was labeled on the menu. And I'm like, okay, so what's gluten-free? And she's like, I have no idea. I'm like, 
so I ordered something without the bread on and, and, and on the menu item, it didn't even say it came on bread. And actually that happened to me at a hotel a couple months ago, back earlier this year too. It doesn't say that it's served on bread. So how do I know? Right. And That's if, another thing too, I've, mm-hmm. I've, I've made a living off of, you know, communications. So it, is some, it comes so easy to me mm-hmm. um, where I think a lot of these, you know, whether it's a hotel or a restaurant or employer could probably benefit from just some sort of a, communications person that can think through all these things and Mm -hmm. be transparent with their customers and employees. Right. And a communications person that has a different disability or, you know, food allergy or what, bring those people in, let them experience your property, you know, or your office in that capacity. Right. From, from their eyes. Yep. From their perspective. Yeah. One of the things that I think has worked really well, you know, back to the vending machine thing is, um, a lot of these offices I've seen will offer up snacks like that is like in baskets or in like a display shelves. And that way I can actually pick up and read the ingredients and flip it over and see what I need to see mm-hmm. before I buy it. And <clears throat> that has saved me a lot of money in recent years, like this idea of open concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. And I actually, in in both of the books, chapters that I wrote, it's like, try to find vendors or ask the vendors, you know, can you procure this? Cause even if it's kosher and vegan and, you know, dairy free or however, find options that meet different dietary needs, but it would be really interesting if vending machines could somehow provide some additional information on what they're serving. Right. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they feel like they could, they're all digital. Now you could probably tap right. to pull up a menu. Mm-hmm. And- yep. I think I saw one at the airport, but I think it was more fresh food than it was pre, oh, you know, yeah. fresh, fresh prepackaged food mm-hmm. versus, you know, the standard candy bars and potato chips and stuff like that. So I, I, I just found the note that I wrote down when you were speaking that one of your friends or one of your former colleagues mm-hmm. had a, a sign in their booth oh, that, yes. or, or their cubicle. Tell us about yeah. that. Back in the day, there was a colleague who had a really severe peanut allergy. So like it was airborne, it was the dust, it just like couldn't go. So they just got tired of saying it over and over and over to colleagues. And they had a lot of foot traffic to their cubicle from people from other departments and other floors. So they just found a little, there's like a, like a, you know, one of those stop signs with like the X through it that mm-hmm. had a big pic- picture of a peanut on it. And it was like a peanut free zone. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it just kind of was a conversation starter or people could just look at it and choose not to talk about it. But it was just a way for them to get the message out there without having to explain it over and over again. Yeah. And, and that, that's a good point. And this one woman I talked to that, you know, she should have that one that with the fish on it, no sea or no seafood, right. In this, in this vicinity, vicinity of her, but even in the break rooms and, and it was a challenge with that. So yeah, um, hard. a lot of the yeah. shared kitchen, you know, mm-hmm. um, if, if there is a place for you to prepare your own food, it's all shared surfaces. It's a shared microwave. Like there's one time I went to go use a microwave and it had like, I guess someone made Mac and cheese in it. Cause there was like melted cheese on the sides. And then I'm like, should I put my food in here? I can't exactly clean it up. Like I don't have gloves right. on me or <laughs> anything. And so, or do I just eat my soup cold? Like, you know, there are worse things mm-hmm. to do. Or, so yeah, it's, it's another thing to think about. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, you are, you're so adaptable just listening to you talk. You're so adaptable and you're like, there's worse things that could be right. But it's also, I'm like, how can we be more helpful? Right? How can employers and empl- and coworkers be more helpful for somebody with a food allergy? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like a two way street. So, like you said earlier, legally, employers cannot ask us about our disabilities. So, it is on us to speak up and just put it out on the table. But in the, from what I learned from talking with a lot of other young adults with food allergies at the fair summit, is we just hate to feel like we're a burden and we don't really like a whole lot of attention on us and. We don't want to make things harder than they need to be. And like that really eats at our souls and we don't want it to define us. So I think once it's on the table, I think if employers could just ask, okay, so what does this mean? What does this look like for you? What types of accommodations work for you? Um, what things do we want to avoid? Because if, if, it's, if we don't feel like we're the ones making the demands, it might be a little bit of a smoother uh, and more mm-hmm. positive experience. Otherwise, if we're over here making demands to someone who really has no idea why it's so severe or why it needs to be this way, mm-hmm. or it could be pretty off-putting. So right. 
I think just trusting the person when they say they have severe food allergies and just, you know, doing whatever you can to make them comfortable, just talking about it Mm -hmm. can go a long way in helping them. I, and I think that business resource group is a great idea, but I also Mm -hmm. think maybe doing a lunch and learn, right. Mm -hmm. You know, have people come in and maybe you bring in, you know, something that is nut free and milk free for people to eat. Because a lot of people also think that food that's free of nuts or free of milk tastes horrible. Yeah. Right. That's a really good, that's a really good point. That's a really good idea. I did that. I did that once back when I had time before I had a kid, I brought in (laughs) cookies for my birthday to share with people. And they were like, Oh my God, this is so good. And I was like, yeah, they don't have milk or nuts in them. And they're like, no way this doesn't have milk. They're like, no butter, no milk. And I was like, yeah, no butter, no milk. And then they're like, no egg. I'm like, no, they have egg because I don't have the egg (laughs) allergy. (laughs) But you know, people like it just shows that, you know, Mm -hmm people look at the old food pyramid and eggs and milk were in the same triangle. So they assume that a dairy allergy includes eggs. It's just, you know, chiseling away at breaking down misunderstandings. Right. Yeah. And a friend of mine that works at Whole Foods says he was in the grocery aisle. He's like five times a day. He got asked, can I get dairy free mayonnaise? And he's like, mayonnaise is dairy free. And they're like, no, it's not. It contains eggs. And, Mm. and I've seen hotels label it, you know, with man, something that has mayonnaise and it contains dairy. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Yeah. No. No. (laughs) And celiac and the beast did a thing years ago. And she's like, eggs come from chickens. Dairy comes from cows. Right. It's just making that distinction. Yep. Yep, Yeah, absolutely. And you brought up, you just made me think of another good point too, just in terms of like having that open communication and understanding. Telling employees or having it written somewhere like on your cubicle or, you know, in some sort of a plan where your EpiPen is, should you get yourself into a situation Mm -hmm. that you cannot administer it yourself? Or, you you know, like people would always ask, okay, where's your EpiPen? Where's your EpiPen? And I just started just keeping it on my desk so that people could could see it. And it was funny during the pandemic, we all started working from home and we thought we'd be back in a matter of weeks. So I left my EpiPen and some other snacks in that drawer and I didn't go back to the office for like two years. So I'm like, oh, these snacks are probably expired and this EpiPen is now expired. (laughs) So, Well, and I love that because this other planner is like, also find a buddy, right? Mm -hmm. Find a coworker, that HR person, your boss or somebody that knows about your allergy and can be your advocate for you when you can't be, Mm -hmm. right? And you said that about your one boss, right? When you were, when you're trying to take that Benadryl, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Figuring and, that and out. It helps too when they're, you know, in a leadership position, especially because right. then it's like everyone is, oh, this is, this is very real. Right. Yeah. I couldn't remember where else I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> there's just a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to navigate and there's a lot to know, but I think you've given, you know, some people, some really good, you know, concrete ideas on, on ways to manage it and, and, and I don't want you to succumb to having to back down all the time and do this, but we, right. you do need support. Right. Oh, yeah. I remember, and I'm going to combine thoughts here. Yeah. I do remember what okay. I was going to say. And I like what you said about, you know, at the times that I did really advocate for myself and kind of put my foot down was if I were to have an allergic reaction at work and if I had to take a Benadryl and if I had to go home because Benadryl knocks you out or if I had to go mm-hmm. home, I would ask respectfully. I'm like, hey, you know, can I take this as a sick day instead of like a PTO day or like if or, you know, if it gets to a point where I'm having a lot of reactions and if I run out of sick days, can we figure out how to navigate this? Because it's not like I'm intentionally having reactions <laughs> like right mm-hmm. it's, it's just that's just another kind of thing too that is another hard conversation to have but I think you know yeah. you're if you have the food allergies it's very valid it's you know because that's when yeah. it comes down to actual that's like a direct benefit that's a direct impact on your benefits exactly well and that brings me back to that woman with the fish allergy and who took it to the state of Massachusetts she had she spent two weeks total combined two weeks in the hospital from anaphylactic reactions she had in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And even though she had communicated her food allergy to her employer and to her direct boss, to the HR department, and it just got ignored. And so, I mean, that's a loss of productivity on her part, not from anything that she did. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 I I wonder if there were any cases, like, was there any precedent for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, who knows? I mean, and like the, the bullying, just kind of going back to the bullying and the peanut one of the kid who worked at Panera. Right. And I don't know if you heard that story or his boss was like, 
teasing him with peanut butter. We're going to put you know, peanut butter in this and we're going to, here's, we're going to put it on your EpiPen. And I know it was settled out of court, but like really people like, how do you manage that? Right. It's definitely yeah. a new, you know, there's all these free trainings now that a lot of companies are implementing in terms of, you know, like harassment training and like inclusion mm-hmm. and diversity training and I would love to see food allergies start to become a kind of a part of that type of training. You know, you're seeing more and more trainings with colleagues in wheelchairs and with other visible disabilities, you know, Mm -hmm. eyesight or hearing. And I would love to see food allergies start to at least get 30 seconds of airtime in these types of trainings. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I, that I do talk about that. It's part of DEI and, and I've been hired by a couple of people to start implementing that, especially in the event side of that. What does DEI mean with food and beverage? And, and it, it's exactly what we've been talking about all day or all morning. So Absolutely. I have one. So I have two questions for you. What is your favorite food and beverage? Oh gosh. My favorite food I would have to say is anything with pasta. I mean, I love okay. pasta. I think it's always filled me up over the years. It's a very versatile food. <laughs> you can do anything with it pretty much. Favorite beverage. I always have to have my can of Coca-Cola every day. It's just my my one little vice. I don't do a whole lot of junk food. I don't do sweets. I can't do a lot of cookies and milk chocolate. So I do (laughs) Coca-Cola. Okay. That works. Okay. And then the final question is what does a safe, from your perspective, what does a safe, sustainable and inclusive food and beverage experience mean to you? Me, you know, if if I'll hammer this point home, I feel like I've been parroting it this whole time, but it's really just comes down to understanding and just patience and just trying to remember that we're all just human and we're all coming from a place of non-malice and maybe we're just trying to understand we're trying to connect and I think there's a lot of times where I know I've certainly been really awkward in the past and I've said the wrong thing and people have said the wrong thing to me in the past but I just want people to feel like they can talk about their food allergies and be welcomed with a stance of trying to understand and just try to know that everyone's just trying to do their best, (laughs) whether it's at work or at home. That's a really good point. And I do have to say, thank you, first and foremost, thank you 100%. And we were supposed to have Noreen on this show. I should have acknowledged that. I think the technology glitch got me all messed up at the very beginning. But Noreen got the flu shot, which then got gave her the flu. So she was supposed to be on here today, but hopefully we'll have her on on another show to talk about this as well. But Lauren, thank you so much for the advocacy work that you do in the food allergy community and in your workplaces. No, and thank you, Tracy, for all you do and for having me on this show. Oh, you're welcome. And next week is going to be super busy. I am going to be at IMAX, which is the meetings industry. I think it's the largest convention for the meetings industry, but I am doing shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday live from the show. And so stay tuned, look for some marketing on that. I'm Monday guest is for people for indigenous people's day. And I'm so excited of who is going to be on the show. And I will market that this afternoon. But Lauren, Lauren and I were here talking about young professionals managing food allergies in the workplace. You can watch this video again. It'll come out on podcasts in a few weeks if you want to listen to it, just the audio portion. But until then, everyone stay safe and eat well. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrat, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.